It's important to prepare the next generation. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball. Today we are doing another team preview. We are looking at the Houston Rockets for today's show. Very interesting team. Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed. To talk about the Houston Rockets, I am joined by the host of the Locked On Rockets podcast, Ben Dubose, is back with us for another year to talk about a Rockets team that is uh, decidedly different to the one we talked about last year. Very different, and it's interesting because if you had asked me this, you know, July 1st, after the first wave of free agency had come and gone, the Rockets tried to get Jimmy Butler and didn't, it looked like it was a team that was going to be very similar to a year ago, banking on continuity. They brought back Austin Rivers brought back Daniel House, and then, as fate would have it, with Kawhi Leonard picking the Clippers on the condition that Paul George could extricate himself from Oklahoma City, that made Russell Westbrook available. We all know the relationship between James Harden and Russell Westbrook, and before you knew it, an offseason that seemed like it was built around the idea of chemistry and the benefits of bringing back the bands, so to speak, all of a sudden now you've got a uh, team that looks very different than the one we last saw three months ago. Let's start with that relationship between Westbrook and Harden. And we know that they used to play together uh, back with the Oklahoma City Thunder. There's so much, I guess, going back and forward about these two between in the past between the opposing fan bases. And it should be Harden, should be Westbrook. You know, this guy's a stab powder, this guy's flopping, all that sort of stuff. Now they're on the same team, but these guys have never had a problem with each other. So in terms of on-court chemistry, there shouldn't, in terms of you know, personality-wise, unlike Harden and Paul, that shouldn't be a problem. But... The, the fit between these two guys on the court, how do we see that going? Who is going to be sacrificing the touches of the ball here? Who's going to be that primary guy, do you think? I think the early clues are that Harden's still going to be the primary guy. I think a big part of it is that they both want to make it work. This is a situation where even if the fit on paper looks a little bit different, in this case, relative to the prior Rocket stars, I would say the Harden era, first Dwight Howard and then Chris Paul, those were basically the best free agents available at a given snapshot in time. And it was more a marriage of convenience because they were just the best options on the market. You know how Gerald Morey looks at it in terms of best player available, figure out the fit later, talent first. This was the first time I would say in Harden's tenure with the Rockets that he went out and got his guy. I don't know that the Rockets certainly do the trade to the extent they did giving up multiple future first round draft picks if James Harden isn't specifically requesting it. So that's going to be a different dynamic. The fact that clearly it's something that Harden wants, and I'm sure he's had or had dialogue with Westbrook prior to the deal, that they think that there's a way for it to work. It's not just a best player available type thing. Now, as far as the actual fit, I think what little we've heard, the press conference of Westbrook getting introduced to Houston, he unsolicited mentioned how when he was in Oklahoma City, he used to cut without the ball at times. And we all know, you know, this goes back seven years. But even when Harden was earlier in his career, that was just his first three years before he was truly considered a superstar. Down the stretch of those games, many times it was Harden basically handling the ball and Westbrook playing the two and Durant playing the three. And what little... Hence, we've had to this point suggest that that would continue. The Rockets have pointed out that Westbrook's shooting percentages, when he's actually open, are not that bad. He's also had, at least earlier in his career, some success at off-ball movement. Now, he hasn't had that very often in the Oklahoma City days the last few years, but it goes back to, you know, did he have someone that could really create the way that Harden can and will in Houston? So, There's definitely questions, and you're asking Westbrook to turn back the clock five or seven years in terms of his approach. But I just think even though Harden's a better shooter, he's just such a superior pick-and-roll ball handler and decision-maker compared to Westbrook. You know, Westbrook is a good passer. Harden is an all-time great passer. So my guess is that you'll still see Harden as sort of the primary guy bringing the ball up the floor. Westbrook will do it in spurts. Certainly, I think it'll help to keep Harden's load down. 
Also, just as they tried to stagger Mike D'Antoni, they staggered the minutes with Chris Paul and James Harden. I think we'll see the same thing with Russell Westbrook and James Harden. So you will have 12 to 14 minutes a game that Westbrook is out there without Harden, and in those, he'll be the guy. But my guess is that when both are on the floor, it's generally still going to be somewhat similar to a year ago that James Harden is the guy that's initiating the offense. Yeah, that's sort of the way I see it as well. And I think probably, I mean, that, that was the case last year with Paul and Harden, yeah, but Harden's uh, assist numbers did dip. I think we're still going to see Westbrook get his assist, but I don't think that his uh, streak of three consecutive triple-double seasons is going to continue for Westbrook. So I think we should be looking at it that way. He also, Westbrook, we talk about, you know, these high usage guys. He took a big step back in usage last year, Westbrook playing alongside Paul George, just down to 30, which is, of course, is a big step back from 35 the year before and 42 the year before. Before that, so I think that we're going to see. You know, Westbrook averaged 23, 11, and 10 last year. I think that anything like 22, 9, and 8, or something along those lines, would be realistic for Westbrook this season. I think that pushes him probably into the back end of a second round in fantasy drafts. He's obviously ranked too high on ESPN at number eight, 14 on Yahoo's probably a little bit too high. And the concern we all have with Westbrook from a fantasy point of view is, of course, the free throw percentage, which has just cratered off 66% last season for literally no apparently good reason. Uh, if that three-point percentage can come up, which I have a little bit of faith that it will improve from the 29% he was at last year, that does help him. But that free throw issue and with how often he gets to the line, that's obviously a real concern for his overall value. Harden led the league with 36 points a game last season. How far down do you think that comes this year? I would say to the 29, 30 mark, that area. I mean, you never say never with Harden, but I think a lot of what happened a year ago, Chris Paul missed nearly 25 games. They had injuries to Eric Gordon, Clint Capella, and that streak was one of necessity. And then, you know, the Rockets, they started 11 and 14, so they needed to win those games just to stay in the playoff mix, quite frankly. And then even when Chris Paul came back, he never quite looked like the same guy. Age took a toll. So I think between the Rockets being healthier and Westbrook having a track record relative to Chris Paul at being more durable at that level of health lasting throughout the season, my guess is that you see Harden's scoring come down just a smidge to a more reasonable level, probably closer to 30 than in the mid-30s. But I think his efficiency should, uh, should remain relatively level with where it was a year ago. I just think you'll see the usage dip down a little bit. And I think, you know, he just turned 30 years old earlier this week so i think this is a case the rockets aren't going to go to a Kawhi leonard style load management suddenly but i do think you'll see them if they can take a minute or two off here or there i think now with harden in his 30s and westbrook's going to be 31 i think they'll be a little bit proactive with those guys yeah that's you know we heard maury talk about you know potential resting these guys and d'antoni's it's been mentioned in the past and it's literally never happened uh i don't think we're going to be having like you said Kawhi leonard levels of load management but i i do agree with you i think we're going to harden played 37 minutes a game last year there is no way in my mind that he approaches that number i think both he and westbrook will see a reduction in their minutes it's not going to be you know they're not going to be playing 30 a night but they're not playing 30 seven and I feel pretty good in saying that in terms of Harden I still think he was that far better than everybody else in fantasy basketball last year that still with the arrival of Westbrook and with scoring five or six fewer points per game he still is in that mix for number one the the grouping of guys at number one is really tight so you can go any direction you want but I still think that Harden is a, is a solid choice for number one and should never fall out of the top three or top four for fantasy basketball, irrespective of the arrival of Westbrook. People had that uh, that concern when Paul arrived, that we're not going to pick Harden, and uh, he still was that number one guy, and has been that number one guy over the past three years, and I don't think too much, I think too much is going to change there with Jim uh, in terms of what he does, even though that's scoring, and maybe this has come down. He just does everything else so well, and as you mentioned, that could be offset a little bit by an increase in efficiency. The... Um, the interesting thing here, I guess, is that you know, the, the more switched on fantasy people are, are thinking about it, is Clint Capella and how this impacts him. Because yes, having Harden and Westbrook around could open things up a lot for him, but we know Westbrook's history in terms of grabbing rebounds and taking rebounds away from his yep. center. And Capella is the next guy in line to perhaps be victim to that in terms of his uh, accumulation of, of numbers. Now, do you think that that is going to be something that happens? Is there any way that Westbrook doesn't you know, start going after all these rebounds that he's done in the past? I think it's probably going to happen. We heard Gerald Morey in one of his podcasts after the trade. He mentioned that the way they view it, those rebounds, even if Westbrook is taking it from Capella in terms of starting the transition offense, they like the ball starting in the hands of Russell Westbrook as opposed to having, you know, Capella have to kick it to Westbrook or Harden or whoever it may be. So 
I don't think the Rockets are going to try and reconfigure his habits. I think that's just something that they're going to try and make the best with. And hopefully, you know, if some of those lead to transition breaks because Westbrook is able to get it and dart the other way 90 feet, then maybe that's something that they'll have that they didn't a year ago with Chris Paul. With that said, as far as Clint Capella in particular, I think that's a drawback. You could see a couple of rebounds that he had last year. I think it was at 12 and a half, 13 again. You could see that drop a couple to kind of see those go to Russell Westbrook. The one benefit that I think Russell Westbrook could give to Clint Capella, as much as we've seen Capella as a lob threat for James Harden, one thing that you have not seen the last couple of years, and I get asked this, or I had been asked this so much by Rockets Twitter, Josh, is why aren't Clint Capella and Chris Paul connecting more on lobs? Because Chris Paul is this a guy who's the second or third best point guard of all time. And if Capella is this much of a threat as a lob man, for James Harden, then why wasn't that an option for Chris Paul? And my theory on this is that Chris Paul, the combination of his limited size, but then especially his lack of burst, his diminishing athleticism the last couple of years, the eye test, the way it looked for me, Josh, was that defenders didn't really respect Chris Paul's ability to finish anywhere near the bucket. So you didn't have that help defender feeling compelled to come over when Chris Paul is on the drive. Whereas with Russell Westbrook making the drives instead of Chris Paul, I believe last year, even though he turned 30, I think it was one of Russell Westbrook's highest is uh, his highest percentages at finishing at the rim in quite a while, maybe his entire career, he was still really good. So I think you're going to see def uh, defenders pay a lot more attention to a driving Russell Westbrook than they did a driving Chris Paul. And so because of that, you could see even more lobs open up for Clint Capella. So I think that's the slight positive. You may see him lose a couple of rebounds to Westbrook, but I think you might could see Westbrook unlock some of the uh, alley-oop game that wasn't always there between Capella and CP3. Yeah, I think we're going to see his efficiency rise a little bit. He was a 65% field goal guy last year. I could see that creeping up towards 67, 68 with those easier looks around the rim, which doesn't offset completely the lack of rebounds, but it gets close. Now, he is overranked Capella on ESPN at number 20. He wasn't the 20th best player last year. He was 27th. So I don't think expecting that level of improvement is realistic. He's 48th on Yahoo. That might be a little bit low, but he's in that sort of mix as a back-end third-round guy, a fourth-round sort of a player. After those three guys for Houston, it does get a little bit um, a little bit murky in terms of their overall fantasy value. Eric Gordon started a lot of last season as the starting small forward. Ben, I don't believe that he'll be the starter this season, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. I would guess that it's Daniel House. Yeah. We have not heard yet, and I think you know that'll largely be sorted out in training camp. But my guess is that they want to get back to something a little more traditional in terms of their size. It's not as if they wanted to start Eric Gordon at the three a year ago. If you recall, they started with James Ennis. It's just Ennis was never really a fit in Houston, and they just never really replicated that Trevor Ariza formula from a year ago. Well, actually, briefly, in the middle of the year, when they were at their best, Daniel House Jr. was starting at the three. It was when Chris Paul was out, Eric Gordon slid down to the two, and then you had Daniel House at the three. Well, then he had the contract standoff. He came back after a two-month absence only about a month before the postseason, and there was never really a chance at that point to kind of reintegrate him with the starters. And so Eric Gordon was the guy at the three, albeit undersized and not much of a rebounder. And in terms of their defensive fall off, I actually think even though Trevor Ariza was never a great rebounder, just his ability to box out and his length relative to uh, uh, Eric Gordon a year ago, I do think that had a role, especially in the playoffs, with some of their shortcomings on that end of the floor. But I think the Rockets, it was just circumstantial what led them to put Eric Gordon at the three. I think they'd like to be bigger. Now, the one area that you might could push back on, I mentioned the rebounding. Well, now that you have Russell Westbrook, who's going to get nine or ten rebounds a game, I think we agree, then all of a sudden would that let you go a little bit smaller with Eric Gordon and instead bet on the shooting, perhaps. But the reason I think they'll still go with House is that it's not like House is a bad shooter. He shot better than 40% from three during the regular season last year. So as long as he is a good enough three-point shooter, I think they want to get back to being a little more traditional, a little more length, because, you know, P.J. Tucker is 34. He's six foot six. They're not especially long at the four either. So I don't think they want to be as overall small as they were a year ago. I think they'd like to go back to having Gordon as, you know, a bench facilitator, someone that kind of jumpstarts that second unit. 
And I just think that it's a cleaner rotation for Mike D'Antoni if you start Daniel House. And, you know, when you look at House's deal, three years, $11 million, it was suggested right after that by, I think it was Kelly Eco of The Athletic, that perhaps they had already discussed the Rockets and House um, using him in a bigger way, meaning a starting role for this coming year, because that's definitely a pretty sweetheart deal compared to what I expected him to get heading into free agency. So for all of those reasons, I think House probably starts. Gordon comes off the bench, although House will have to play well in training camp to earn it. Now, I do think both will play a lot. But of course, when you start, as opposed coming off the bench, generally it's a little bit easier for the starter to get closer to 30 minutes and the bench guy tends to be closer to 25. So at the end of the day, I don't think it's a huge variable who starts between House and Gordon, who comes off the bench. But those five minutes that the starter gets extra, that could be all the difference in determining whether they're statistically viable as a fantasy guy or not. Yeah, look, Gordon was outside the top 150 last year and played th- almost 32 minutes a night. I don't think he's anyone that you really need to be considering in standard leagues. I still think he'll get his 30 minutes off the bench. He hasn't played under 30 minutes at any point in his career, even when coming off the bench for the Rockets. I still think he'll do that. He's just an anemic rebounder. He had like two rebounds a game last season. And right. With Chris Paul around, his assist drop, it's not going to change with Westbrook there. He's not going to be handling the ball very much. He gets no defensive numbers and his efficiency fell right off. I think there might be a bounce back in some of that efficiency where he had a true shooting of under league average 55% last season. I think that will increase again this season. But overall, he's someone that you look to as a stream option for points. He'll hit a lot of threes, but otherwise there's just a lot of negatives in what he does overall. As for House, you mentioned the shooting. It was excellent last season, especially his two-point shooting. 60% on twos, 42% on threes in the 39 games that he played. He played 25 minutes a game, and I think that'll bump up, but he still is in more of that stream option for threes. He's not going to do... He's a better rebounder than Gordon, but still lacks the defensive numbers, doesn't get to the line very often, but overall is uh, is a more efficient player Had a true shooting of 65% last season, but he's not going to be a high-volume guy. He's going to be out there hitting threes, playing off of um, Harden and Westbrook and and knocking those threes down and playing some defense. But the minutes will be up, so guys in deeper leagues, he does become a more realistic target and a more... um, a more uh, reliable guy in those deeper formats for this uh, for this coming season. PJ Tucker, you mentioned, who will once again be the starting power forward, didn't uh, didn't end up getting onto Team USA because an ankle injury kept him out there. Tucker is that guy. I don't really see too much changing with what PJ does. He's not going to score. He's going to hit threes. The um, he's going to get steals. He does that in bunches, and he's solid enough as a back end fantasy guy. There's not much that really changes for PJ this season, though. No, not at all. He's the guy they're going to plug in, and he's going to be 3 and D, their option at the 4. He's not going to have that much value on a consistent basis as a rebounder or a scorer, but certainly he's someone that's capable on a given night if he gets a lot of looks from 3, especially from the corners, he's able to heat up. Really, at this point, the Rockets know what he is. They're going to slide him in there for 32, 34 minutes per game. This is his third year in Houston. The first year, the minutes were a little down because they were trying to integrate him. If you recall, it took until... I believe it was February, right after the All-Star break, before they permanently switched to Tucker at the four over Ryan Anderson last year. And this year, he's going to be permanently the guy. So there's not a lot of upside from the standpoint of, you know, at 34 years old, he is who he is. But he's remarkably durable. A year ago, I believe he was the only Houston player to play in all 82 games. He actually started all of them as well. Same goes for the playoffs, of course. So he's very durable. He's going to be out there. There's nothing statistically that's going to jump with him. But at the same time, he is someone that I think you can count on being out there. You know, the even the ankle injury that cost him Team USA, I think we all know that a lot of that had to do with maintenance. It's the type of thing where if a player has anything wrong at all, then they're not going to want to, especially right before training camp, go through just for the World Cup, putting that type of wear and tear. So as long as there's no unexpected major injury, I think he's someone that You know, there's not a ton of upside statistically, but there's a lot of certainty. There's a high floor, so to speak, that you know he's going to be out there and you know that he's going to give you at least a couple of threes every night on average. Yeah, and he'll get you one and a half steals, and that provides okay back-end value with pretty much no upside at all. But there is still use in getting a guy that you know is going to hit threes and get steals. Obviously, his field goal percentage has been bad. It's been under 40% both of the seasons he's been in Houston, even though his three-point percentage has been good. He just doesn't hit twos at any sort of solid rate. He's not the best rebounder, and of course, Westbrook may also impact that as well. But we sort of know what Tucker is, and that's totally fine. Now, the Rockets did bring in a Another backup center, Tyson Chandler, is here. Is he going to be on the uh, Nene plan for this coming season? 
yeah, he'll be on the Nene plan. I'd be very surprised. Even if Clint Capella gets an injury, I think you're going to see Chandler being pretty much a consistent 15 minutes per game player. This is his year 19 in the NBA. So I think he's going to be pretty limited with regards to how they use him. Even if there is an injury to Clint, I don't think Chandler's going to be a guy to bump up. I think Chandler's going to be a guy 15 minutes per game. They'll give him, you know, nights off here or there. I think the total, you know, what they're aiming for will probably be 15 minutes a game, 60 of 82 games, and then hope to kind of slowly get him closer to 20 a game by the playoffs if they need it, assuming, of course, that his form warrants it. If there's any upside with the Rockets, and of course it's not worth drafting, but if there is an injury that happens to Clint Capella, he missed 15 games a year ago with a thumb. I would actually keep an eye on uh, Anthony Bennett, who they signed in the offseason as a non-guarantee. There's also rumors they're supposed to bring in Terrence Jones. There's a long way to go for either of those guys. The reason I mentioned them, Daryl Morey, after bringing in Westbrook, Morey has been pretty insistent that they wanted to look at more shooting bigs. And so if something should happen to Capella, this is not going to be a situation where even though Tyson Chandler is the backup, you're not just going to see them plug in Chandler and then start playing him 30 minutes per game. If Capella goes down with anything like what happened for, I believe, five weeks last year, then they're going to have no choice but to sink or swim with one of these younger guys. And again, it's not someone that you would draft. It's just something to kind of keep an eye on because the Rockets, in terms of their center depth chart, it's a bit non-traditional in that even though Chandler will be a solid backup in terms of his basketball value to the team, statistically, I think no matter what happens to Capella, Chandler's going to be fairly similar in terms of his minutes because there's just not any upside to risk you know, increasing him to 25, 30 minutes per game in the regular season, as you said, very similar to Nene in that regard. Yeah, um, Anthony Bennett, also a guy that shot, you know, over 40% from three in the G League the last couple right. of seasons. And another guy that you didn't mention there is another option there would be Isaiah Hartenstein, who uh, yep. I really like his statistical profile. He showed out at the beginning of last season when Nene was struggling and then sort of got lost uh, in the shuffle. I, I like Hartenstein as a guy that could come in. I, would, I was hoping they'd use him as the backup center before they signed Chandler this season. Or where's his progress at? Has it stalled at all? No, he had a really good year. I believe he was MVP of the uh, G League Finals back in uh, March or April, whatever that was. He had a good year. The only downside to uh, Hartenstein is that the three-point percentage dropped. That was a relatively small sample. And if you ask the Rockets about it, they'll point out that a big part of his dip happened early in the year. He got better as the season moved along. But overall, I think he shot like 35% from three as a rookie in the G League, and that dipped to like 27% last year. So he does bring you a lot of positives with regards to his motor, his defense. He's fairly smart. He has a good work ethic. He did get hurt in a summer league play this year, but nothing significant. He'll be ready for camp. So he's an option. I mentioned Bennett and Jones first because those are guys that were better than 40% from three a year ago. That seems to be something that they're prioritizing in terms of these end-of-the-bench bigs. Hartenstein, at times, you know, the form on his jumper looks fine. He does a lot of other things that they want, but the one bit of cold water I think that you have to throw on him is that that three-point percentage or 27% a year ago at the G League. They need to see progress from that, I think, before with his profile he would get um, rotation run uh, with the big league club. Let's talk about some guys who will be in the rotation. Let's start with Gerald Green, who was uh, rescued off the scrap heap a couple of years ago and now seems to be a solid part of this rotation. He's 33 years of age, but another sort of 20-minute-a-night role for Green seems like it's in the offing. There's not much that's really changed in that backup rotation with Green and Rivers likely to get all those minutes there along with Gordon. Well, and I think an issue with Green, he doesn't have the upside that he had at times the last couple of years because of the Chris Paul injury factor. Even yeah. though he's not a backup point guard, you would see so many of these depth guys for the Rockets because of the inevitable 25 games that Chris Paul would miss, they would get bumped up. And I think the same thing applies with Austin Rivers as well. You know, you had, I, I think it was about a month stretch right after Rivers signed where he was playing 30-plus minutes a night. You know, they signed and immediately thrust him in there because they had no choice with Paul out with the hamstring. So I think those types of guys this year – you know, they should be in the rotation. We've heard from Maury the last couple of weeks that they consider themselves to have a nine-man rotation entering training camp and then the rest uh, basically battling for edge of the bench spots, the nine guys, the five starters. Well, we know who they are. Well, we know four of the five starters and then the Eric Gordon, Daniel House. So you basically have six between the four guys, Gordon and House, and then the other three are Chandler, Rivers, and Green. So I would just say – all those guys are consistently going to get at least 15 minutes, I would think. But there's also not quite the same upside 
assuming that Harden and Westbrook remain as durable as they've been the last few years because you just don't have that injury waiting to happen where all of a sudden you're going to have to extend, if you're Mike D'Antoni, a guy like Gerald Green or Austin Rivers to uh, 30 minutes for a certain stretch. Yeah, and those guys did have those big big minute games, but they're players who consistently need 34, 35 minutes a night to really be of much use in fantasy leagues. They're more really deeper league players. Uh, Green is probably a better option than Rivers even in fewer minutes because he hits threes at such a significantly higher rate, and Rivers does struggle in terms of you know being a low rebound guy, a poor free throw percentage guy as well. Uh, weirdly enough, as a guard, he's a pretty poor shooter from the line. So those guys aren't big impact players. Uh, a guy that did come onto the scene a little bit for this team last season and then faded away was Gary Clark. Um, what are the Rockets looking to use him for? He was he was playing really well early on and, and played some big minutes and was playing over Carmelo Anthony and then he sort of just disappeared out of the rotation. Yeah, he was basically... When they moved on from Carmelo, what a lot of folks don't realize about how all of that went down. It wasn't so much about the Rockets or Carmelo all of a sudden having a different view of one another. What happened, they got off to that four and seven start. Everything went haywire. And basically what they wanted was a placeholder that could get them back to the formula that they had a year ago. And the bottom line is Carmelo Anthony is not going to replicate Trevor Ariza or Luke Babute. Just stylistically, it is night and day different. Whereas with Gary Clark, he was capable, at least to a small extent, of giving you some similar value in terms of what he can do defensively, his IQ, offensively, at least at times he proved capable of shooting the three. Now, as the season progressed and they were able to sign Daniel House and then Austin Rivers, those two established themselves, even though they're a little bit smaller, as better rotation options. You know that Mike D'Antoni is not afraid of going small. And then with Clark as, Clark as a rookie, they largely developed him at the end of the bench and in the G League. Moving forward, a lot of it, it's somewhat similar to Hartenstein in that it's going to come down to how well he shoots the three. I know it's simplistic, but with Mike D'Antoni, that's often the truth. Now, there is a role, you know, you could see Gary Clark in that small ball five opportunity, the same way you mentioned Anthony Bennett and Terrence Jones. You could see him into that mix in the maintenance games for uh, Tyson Chandler or if Capella has an injury. But also where you could see Clark having a path the Rockets don't really have a backup power forward behind P.J. Tucker. And that's not really a huge hole because we all know that Mike D'Antoni is not afraid at all of playing small. But at the same time, when you look at the depth chart, you know, I'm sure there are some games, some opponents around the league where you do wish that you had a little bit more size. And so it's a team where, you know, other than Clint Capella and P.J. Tucker, there's a lot of yeah buts with regards to their front line, their size, you know. Tyson Chandler is probably still a good player, but you're not going to play more than 15 minutes a game. And he's going to have, I guess, you know, one of every four games off entirely. And then the other guys you mentioned up front, you know, Anthony Bennett, Terrence Jones, Isaiah Hartenstein, those are all relatively young. And so there's a lot of risk. That's where Clark, you know, if he works on his three point shot and, you know, he's established himself as a pretty good defender. A year ago, he got phased out because, you know, eventually, again, they signed Austin Rivers, they signed Daniel House. I think that's the potential path, you know, is that when you look at that upfront roster for the Rockets outside of Capella and Tucker, there's not a lot of certainty. There's not a lot of guys you can point to at the backup four or the backup five and say, wow, this guy is clearly going to be an option. So Gary Clark, he's a little undersized relative to those other Bennett Jones and uh, Hartenstein types that we've been discussing, but you could basically throw him in that same mix as an option if Capella gets hurt or you know, just to help withstand uh, minutes limitations for veterans like Tucker and Tyson Chandler. The back end, or actually on Clark, he, he did put up some interesting defensive numbers, some block and steal numbers last season, but I just don't think the role is going to be there for that to have any impact. But that is worth watching, especially if that three-point shot can come around at all. The back end of the roster is filled with uh, Ben McLemore, Chris Clemens, Vincent Edwards, Michael Frazier, Trayvon Duval, a whole bunch of guys that I'm sure many people listening to this podcast haven't even heard of before, and I don't think they're going to see <laughs> any sort of run really at all. Clemens was interesting in summer league, a second leading scorer throughout the whole tournament, but really, really undersized. But at least he does what uh, Maury and D'Antoni like, and that is uh, take and hit a lot of three-pointers. But yeah, finding minutes for those guys is going to be pretty tough on this squad. I'm just going to run through some uh, value and bust guys on this. I think PJ Tucker, who's uh, drafted in Yahoo, 168, there's a bit of value in him there. I also don't like Westbrook at number eight on ESPN, as I mentioned. I think that's a little bit too high for him, given he wasn't even the eighth best player last season. I don't see that being the case for him this year. Ben, 
Thank you for jumping on the show and talking about the Houston Rockets. It's going to be a wild season for you guys. Everything's wild open for Houston to push towards a championship, and you'll have everything covered over on Locked on Rockets. Let everyone know where they can find you over on uh, Twitter. Yeah, absolutely. You can find me on there at Ben Dubose, B-E-N-D-U-B-O-S-C. And I'm always on there on Twitter. You can follow the show at Locked on Rockets. And of course, you can uh, listen to the show and hopefully subscribe at the same places that people listen to your show, Locked on Podcast Network. We've got Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, great distribution. So, yeah, wherever you check out Locked on Fantasy Basketball, you can check out Locked on Rockets as well. Do that. Give us both a five-star rating and review. Ben, thank you again for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right, guys, that'll wrap it up for today's show. Make sure you're following me at redrock underscore b-ball as well and subscribe exactly like Ben said. Also on YouTube, hit subscribe, leave a comment, give it a thumbs up. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.